Sparky Lyle. He has never started a game in the major leagues. He never won more than 13 games in any season. He never pitched more than 137 innings in any year. Yet, during the 60s and 70s, he was probably the most dominant relief pitcher of all time. To that period of time, he was the only Cy Young Award winner among finishers instead of starters. A pitcher who made relief pitchers proud of their profession and a colorful character who enjoyed sitting nude on gooey birthday cakes as much as he enjoyed snapping his slider past a hitter. In the pantheon of New York Yankees baseball history, the name Sparky Lyle ranks right at the top. Sparky Lyle's stock had risen to the point that in Murray Allen's book entitled Baseball's Top 100 Baseball Players of All Times, he was ranked 64th and at that time dubbed the best relief pitcher of all time. Here's a unique interview between Jim Roselli and Sparky Lyle in 1996. Good morning, I'm Jim Roselli. And I'm Russ Dietrich. And welcome to the times of your life. And thanks to the Chautauqua County Sports Hall of Fame, Chip Johnson and Greg Peterson and the others, we have an excellent opportunity to visit with one of the great baseball players of all time. As a matter of fact, Greg Peterson gave me an interesting book and it said Maury Allen wrote it a few years ago, back in 1981, and he put together a book saying the 100 greatest baseball players of all time. Now stop and think of the history of baseball, <laughs> and 100 players are selected at that time as the best. Number 64 on that list is the man he said the greatest relief pitcher the game has ever seen, Sparky Lyle from Reynoldsville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Sparky, how about that ranking? Uh, for one thing, I think Maury lost his job over that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I was I was very surprised, uh, you know, to see that. But you know, I I talked with him about that, and and uh, I think what he based that on was, uh, you know, I I never missed a game. I uh, I was always there. I threw every day. There were a lot of times I threw uh, 16 straight days, which you know I was proud of back then, and. Uh, I never really got hit real hard, and, and I think Maury based that, uh, uh, you know, my ranking on, on that. Plus, you know, he had a chance to, to really see me play a lot because he was, he was there all the time, but uh, I was very, very flattered for that. I, I told him I wouldn't have cared if I was 100, you know, and I, I, I thought 64 was a little high, but uh, I'll take it, you know. <laughs> Certainly. Well, I tell you, a, a gentleman like that who has, uh, who has the opportunity to, to study the records and probably witnessed a lot of games. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, no, no question, deservedly so, for Sparky Lyle. Russ, 
It's quite a pleasure for us to meet uh, one of the great ball players. Well, it most certainly is, Jim, and our community is really pleased that Sparky's able to put the uh, sports banquet into his schedule and be here. And, you know, I, as he mentions uh, Mr. Allen's, Go ahead. as he mentioned Mr. Allen's work, you can see that you know he was making his judgment on the things that are, are very important for a day-by-day -day ball player. Right. Well, Sparky, we do want to get some background, of course, just just to let people know how a young man gets into the world of baseball. <laughs> when you were born in Resville, PA, your first your first thought of your first moment holding a baseball in your hands. Well, I I, I mean, of course, that was that was in Little League uh, as far back as I can remember, and uh, I can remember my father uh, had to manage the team because uh, the guy that had it the the year before didn't want to do it anymore, and and I was just beside myself, you know. The, because my dad was always uh, not hard on me, but uh, you know, uh, it didn't matter how good a game I had. Uh, he never told me how good a game it was. If I made one mistake in that game, he'd say, "Well, you know, you did this wrong." You know, and I thought, "Oh man, you know, if I if, if I got to listen to this all year, I I wasn't going to have a fun." But it turned out to be really, really great. And uh, you know, playing in, in Reynoldsville, Pennsylvania, there. Uh, after I got through Little League, I went to Babe Ruth, and I couldn't make the team, and I was very, very upset about that. And I, I, I didn't make the team be simply because uh, uh, the same situation came about to where they didn't have anybody to manage the team, and the guy that did take over really didn't know anything about baseball. He was more of a fan than than a manager or anything, and uh, I wasn't very big at the time, and he just, he wouldn't give me a uniform because of my size. It had nothing to do with me throwing or hitting or anything like that, and I've always resented that guy right up to this day. <laughs> well, uh, I understand you, you signed for a, a contract in baseball without even asking what the bonus might be. Well, I... My dad asked about the bonus, and the guy just kind of gave him a blank stare. So <laughs> I just said, "Never mind, Dad." So, uh, but I guess back then uh, we could have got five thousand dollars. But uh, and, and uh, you know, as that turns out, uh, that that really helped me because when I got down there and I saw these kids that did get this five thousand dollar bonus, I thought, "Geez, I must be worth ten, twenty thousand." <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and it did make me uh, try a lot harder because. Uh, Jim Fry, who was a manager in Bluefield, West Virginia at that time, uh, told me that, you know, hey, the way things work is if it comes down to where they got to take me or one of these guys who got this $5,000, that they're going to take them. It didn't matter about the talent at that point in time. So I was kind of uh, scared about that. So, I mean, that really made me uh, work real hard to, to be, I had to be a lot better than those guys in order to stay. and. And uh, all three of those guys ended up getting released, so I don't care about that 5000 now. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly suddenly didn't make any difference, did it? No. What other kind of memories do you have of that first year in pro ball? Well, that, that first year in pro ball, you know, that I, I guess that's kind of how I, I became a relief pitcher was that uh, by the time that I was signed, uh, George Stoller signed me from the Baltimore Orioles. And uh, by this, by the time he got around to signing me, why well, they had already had spring training, so I only had three days to get there before the season started in the Appalachian League. So when I got down there, why well, uh, uh, Jim Fry says to me, he says, uh, you know, I don't know what to do with you because I've already got my uh, rotation set. He says I'm going to put you in the bullpen till I see what you can do. And I said, okay, that's fine. So I went out there and. Uh, Man, the first couple games I got in, uh, you know, it's, I had guys all over the place. And, I, I mean, not that I wasn't used to pitching with guys on base, but never to come in and inherit that stuff. And, I mean, that was such a rush. I told him, I said, after my first couple times out there, I says, hey, don't even worry about putting me in a rotation. I says, I absolutely love it out there. And I says, not only that, I says, but I can pitch every day, you know. I says, I don't know what you know about me, but I says, my arm never gets sore. I can throw as many days as you want me to throw. And that kind of uh, just put me right into the relief spot then, and I, I've loved it ever since. In your early days, Sparky, <coughs> because you were uh, close to our home here in Jamestown, right. New York, you were down uh, in Dubois, and you right. were near uh, Ludlow, Pennsylvania. Do you remember those days well, uh, playing against some former uh, Jamestown players? Well, I, 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 the only thing I, I remember about uh, anything like that is playing in the uh, Triple ABA tournament, which was in Altoona. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we may have played against some of the Jamestown uh, uh, 
guys in, but uh, I, I really don't remember uh, uh, playing in Ludlow. I really don't. We had some semi-pro teams, and yeah. maybe that uh, maybe you shared some experiences with I, them in. And I, no I could have because I, I know I was very young and I was playing in uh, the J, what they call the JC League back there. So we may have come down here uh, and played, but I, 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 right as you asked me, I can't remember that. I'm sorry. Sparky Lyle, <laughs> of course, uh, a Cy Young Award winner uh, in baseball, and I think the first relief pitcher to ever win the Cy Young Award? Well, I, I was the first relief pitcher in the American League. Uh, Mike Marshall had won it, um, I guess, four or five years previous to that. But Mike Marshall won it for being in 110 games that year, which is just, I mean, that's a feat I don't think will ever be uh, ever be mm -hmm. topped. I, I don't think it was so much, I, I, I'm not taking anything away from Mike Marshall. I don't think it was so much uh, of his record or effectiveness at that time I think it was the record of the 110 games and and uh, you know I came in second for that award a couple times and they just didn't want to give it to a relief pitcher and and uh, but the I mean the year I saved 35 games which uh, you know that had set a record at that time uh, you know that I came in second that year they, they just didn't want to give that thing to me and I, I said man if I don't get it then I'm never gonna get it and uh, the year I finally did win and I had 26 days but I had 13 wins that year so uh, I polish it every day so <laughs> Sparky what's the difference physically and mentally between a starter and a relief pitcher well I, I, I think one of the things uh, is a starter has more time to prepare uh, they go over, uh, you know, you get scouting reports, you know, how to pitch every hitter, and uh, they, they're more, you know, they can set up the hitter to, to hit their specific pitch. I mean, Catfish Hunter was one of the best I ever saw at that. He could make guys uh, look silly on any, any of four pitches that he had. Uh, you know, and, and plus they have four days to uh, come back and, uh, you know, the starter had to really uh, basically go seven, eight, nine innings. I mean, back then complete games were uh, big for them then, but, uh, you know, as a relief pitcher, I think uh, you got to have one, maybe two pitches and uh, go in there and, I mean, you're going full bore because you know you're only going to pitch uh, eighth and ninth inning, you know, a couple innings or whatever, but... Uh, I, I never went in and started an inning like a lot of these guys do now. You know, they get that save, they come in and start the ninth inning, they get three outs, and they're heroes. I mean, every time I went in a game, I had guys on base. And I, I, I think you got to have a little bit of ice in your veins, I guess. I mean, I, I, was, I was never nervous. I always felt there was more pressure on the hitter than there was on me because, you know, I knew I was going to throw strikes, so it was entirely up to him to try and hit me. And I, I all, I've always felt, I still feel that way. But uh, you know, I, I think it's something that that you really got to want to do. I don't, I don't think you're going to be a good relief pitcher if you uh, take a guy that was a starter and say, okay, you're going to be in the bullpen now because he, he's just not going to like that. I mean, I absolutely loved it out there. I still do. And and to me, that was, I, I was almost like being a regular player because I was, I was pitching almost every day. And. Uh, you know, but but you've got to have at least one or two good pitches that that you can get over and get people out on. I think that's a, one of the most important things. Speaking of pitches, Sparky <laughs> Lyle, you said that you once asked Ted William, "What's the toughest pitch to hit?" <laughs> he told you it was a slider. Yeah. And so when you heard it from one of the greatest hitters of all yeah. times, you said, "Sparky, I've got to learn. I got to learn that pitch." How did you learn that pitch? Just because Ted William says that's the toughest pitch. <laughs> well, I, uh, the the story. Do we have time to hear that yeah. story? Uh, I had pitched against Florida State this day, and uh, and I struck out, I don't know, 13 guys or something like that in seven innings and shut them out. I mean, man, I was feeling good. And I, I, I was finished doing my running, and I was in the clubhouse. I was really feeling good about the game that I had, and, and, I, and Ted Williams had a very, very loud voice. And all of a sudden, I hear in the clubhouse, uh, where's that left-hander that pitched today? And, and I knew who it was, hollering, and I thought, oh, man, I, I saw right, right here, right here. And, you know, I thought he was going to come over and congratulate me for a good game, and he says, oh, you thought you did real good today. And I says, yeah. He says, I knew every time you were going to throw that curve, I used to throw a curveball with my thumb up in the air. <laughs> and uh, he says, I could see that thumb sticking out of your glove every time you threw that. He says, you'll never go. The he says, you know what the best pitch in baseball is? And I says, yes, I do. And he says, what's that? And I says, change up. And he says, wrong. <laughs> and he says, uh, no, he says, it's a slider. He says, because that's the only pitch that I couldn't hit when I knew it was coming. I said, yes, sir. And he's, so what he did was he told me how the slider broke. 
he didn't really tell me how to throw it or anything like that, but he told me what it did. And uh, so I used to uh, lay in bed at night with the lights out with a baseball in my hand, trying to figure out how to throw this pitch to make it go, like he said. And uh, I was living in a renovator garage at the time, and, and I was uh, right next door to a bar with a big parking lot and a street light. And after about two weeks, I, I, it just came to me in the dark, and I get up, and I get dressed, and I go out, and the only street light there was was in this parking lot. So I'm throwing this ball against the side of my little <laughs> garage there, and people are wondering what the devil I'm <laughs> doing out there. But, I, I mean, I got that thing that night. And... Uh, and Ted always told me, you get that slider, he says, you'll go to the big leagues. Yeah. What, at that point, and you then started to use it, what dramatic difference was there in your pitching? Oh, man, it, it, was, it was absolutely tremendous. I mean, first time I threw it, I mean, it, it, the, it looked like the guy missed this thing by three feet. <laughs> I mean, it was just un unbelievable. And I mean, plus the fact, I, I didn't hang it very often. You know, with a curveball, uh, I didn't hang a lot of curveballs, but it was very difficult to keep down when you're younger and and it was difficult to have enough confidence in it to throw it three and oh I mean and and I mean the very next day I went to that ballpark and I was warming up to win the game and Bob Montgomery was the catcher and I said slider he says you don't have a slider I says today I, yesterday I did <laughs> but today I do and I mean I my strikeouts went way up and uh and I, I would throw this thing on, uh, on three and oh and uh, after a while I just I discarded my fastball, my curveball, everything. I just threw this pitch every single pitch. And I did that in the big leagues for 17 years. I was just going to say, <laughs> Sparky, in all honesty, would that pitch have been responsible for more longevity in the game for you? Oh, absolutely. It, it, not only that, but, I mean, it, it uh, made my control so good because I, I, I looked at this pitch and I says, you know, I only have to throw this pitch in one spot to be successful because you got to pitch right-handers down, you know, inside. So this pitch broke down and in towards their back knee. It was a very tough pitch for them to hit, and I could throw it in the same spot, which made it down and away for left-handers. So that in itself just made my control twice as good. I mean, and and once I got the big leagues, I just, I mean, there's a story where uh, we got Elston Howard uh, when I was with Boston, and the first game he caught me, I come in the game. And the first sign he gives me is a fastball, and I shook him off. And I only had about three weeks in the big leagues. And Dick Williams fined me 50 bucks. He says, this guy's got 20 years in the big leagues. You got two weeks, and you shake him off. <laughs> and I said, well, I says, I didn't want to throw that pitch. And I, I explained to him, and, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. You know, he just, uh, he's, he says, whatever else in, uh, calls you, you throw. And. So then Elston came to me after he was done uh, chewing me out, and he says, hey, from now on, if I put something down that, that you don't want to throw, just stand there for a second, and I'll put, put another sign down. I said, well, I'll make that easy on you. You just put three down all the time, and we won't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest on the Times of Your Life, Sparky Lyle, Cy Young Award winner, 1977, and, of course, many other honors in the uh, world of baseball. Uh, Russ, your question. I'm just wondering, you know, we look at baseball now in uh, 1996 and uh, during the time period you were playing, what do you see that's different uh, uh, for the baseball player primarily? Well, I mean, wh one of the things that, that's different, of course, is the money that they're making, and, and I don't begrudge any of them, you know, making that kind of money, but, but I just think that they're, they're not going at the game the way uh, we did. I mean, uh, you know, we still made pretty good money, too, you know. I mean, I made $90,000 back in... Uh, 1977, I guess, which was not too bad, not too good, but it was uh, more than uh, most people made at that time. And you know, but but we played the game because we loved it, and we wanted to go out and uh, just beat the living daylights out of somebody. Uh, kind of like the way Carmen Basilio uh, fought; he wanted to beat the daylights out of somebody, and so did we. We just didn't hurt him as bad as he did, but. Uh, you know, we and and I, and I think that that now they're playing to uh, to not get hurt for one thing. You know, they they just go out there. They are sort of tentative, and I, I'm not saying everybody, but I'd say 90 percent of these guys are playing that way because they know if they get injured, oh geez, that'll take 500 grand or something off of next year's contract. And I mean, it makes me sick to watch them actually. Sparky Lyle, <laughs> I, I I was going to rush uh, open the question, but I also wanted to get your opinion of. 
of <coughs> the kind of money players are making, which you said seems unbelievable at the time. How, how were they justified in striking uh, uh, the national pastime and making the fans try to understand players and multi-million dollar deals going on strike? Well, I, I, see, I, I have to back the players on that because I don't look at it. Uh, I, I know all the fans looked at that in a way that, you know, here's a guy making $6 million. How can he go on strike? But I got to look at it back if the guy was making $100. Uh, forget about the money that he was making because uh, they can't let them implement that salary cap. Uh, they just can't let them do that. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that happened there is uh, I think if Marvin Miller was handling this, that that strike, it may have happened, but it wouldn't have lasted two weeks. I think Donald Fair is uh, he just not a good, uh, he's not diplomatic. I mean, uh, I went through three strikes with Marvin Miller. Marvin Miller every time the owners would give us a proposal we never just turned around and said hey stick it you know I mean we came back with something else you know we'd say okay well we'll do this if you do this well Donald Fair doesn't want to do that he wants all or nothing I think that's wrong but well, you know because of time limitation uh, Sparky we can't let your baseball career go by without telling some anecdotes and some wonderful stories from the locker room the bus trips uh, the personalities you dealt with over the years, uh, you know, uh, what what kind of a guy was Billy Martin? Give us the funniest incident you had with Billy. Uh, I, I think one of the uh, funniest things with Billy was, uh, you know, what, just before he got fired. Uh, Which time? He, well, <laughs> <laughs> the second time, I guess, <laughs> if I remember right. Uh, you know, I mean, all, usually the reasons for him getting fired was, you know, he, when he started having trouble was, you know, he was uh, getting back to drinking again and everything. And uh, But there was uh, one day that, uh, you know, he just, he was late for the park and uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we're waiting for him to come, waiting for him to come and uh, he doesn't, not showing up, not showing up. So we decided to make the lineup card out. So we made the lineup card. We knew, already knew who was pitching and uh, the thing was, by the time he got there, we were behind one nothing. So he gave us all hell for, <laughs> for, for messing up when he wasn't there. You know, but that was the kind of guy he was. But I, I love, I absolutely love Billy, and, and I, I think everybody else did. You know, he was a, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about him is, uh, you know, he managed just like he played, and he was a little fireball when he played, and he is, uh, you know, exactly the same as a manager. I think he's one of the few managers that. Uh, are out there today that always remembered that he was a player and that that is uh, uh, just makes it so nice to play for a guy like that because he understands everything he understands what you're going through out there what are some of the memories you have of some of the other clubs that you played for uh, besides Boston and New York well I uh, you know one of my fondest memories really is uh, is with the Boston Red Sox uh, number one they're the club that uh, thought enough about me to bring me to the big leagues and uh, I'll always be grateful to that organization for that and uh, you know but uh, you know on top of all that the greatest thing that I ever saw was uh, Carly Stremski when he won the triple crown there in 1967 I mean I have never seen any ball player play like that in my entire life since and uh, you know when people ask me who was the greatest player I ever saw I mean I don't even have to hesitate and uh, not taking anything away from all the other great players of those years but uh, when you see somebody uh, day in and day out and uh, play every single game just about and do the things that Carl Yastrzemski did at that time and and uh, just I mean the beauty of it was that you could go to that ballpark uh, not only having your own confidence but he instilled confidence because you knew that, hey, if we can just get him in the right spot at the right time, that's going to give us a chance to win that game. And uh, you know, that was my rookie year. And I mean, I learned an awful lot from Carl Yastrzemski that year. And that helped me throughout my whole uh, major league career. Is there a lot of truth to the Yogi Berra-isms we hear about? <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> In fact, tonight at the banquet, I'm going to talk about a couple of them. But, uh, you know, the, the thing about Yogi was that, uh, you know, he, he, he was such a, he's such a nice guy. And, and you know exactly what he's saying all the time. It just doesn't come out right. I mean, the, the, the one that I'll say on the air here is, uh, 
I guess that when they went to Cincinnati and, uh, you know, they were going on or it, it was getting dark off early there or something, and he, but he was in the outfield. And he comes in and he says, he turns to uh, Mickey or Elson or whoever it was and, and, and says, boy, it gets laid off early here. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew exactly what he meant, but, the, but that, that was, that's what makes yeah. Yogi Yogi. And uh, I mean, you know, I put hot stuff in my toothpaste and burn his mouth because he used to use my toothpaste all the time. So, <laughs> so I stuck some uh, white heat in there and he'd come over after I went in the shower and put on his toothbrush and start brushing his teeth <laughs> with it and and he comes back to me and I and you know his gums are still on fire from this stuff and uh, to, now this is what he did to really get me back he said okay that's it I'm never using your toothpaste again <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay <laughs> Sparky what one moment in baseball besides I, I want to get to about some other, but what one moment in baseball when you entered the field were in the most <clears throat> pressure uh, situation you can imagine just can you share that with us? Well, I, uh, as I said earlier, I, I never, never really ever felt any uh, pressure situation out there. I mean, I, I was the guy that, I mean, I wanted to be in there with bases loaded. I, I wanted to be in there in the seventh game of the World Series. Uh, I honestly never, never felt that pressure. If there was any kind of pressure like that it was was I got to get my cheeseburgers in time for the game <laughs> <laughs> now that's pressure <laughs> <laughs> what were your thoughts when we had the tragic story of Mickey Mantle passing away at that early age well I was very very uh, down about that uh, you know Mickey and I worked together at the Claridge Casino for five years and uh, I became really really close friends with him and and uh, you know, it, and I was at his golf tournament the year before uh, down at Harbor Club in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, and it, it was just so. It's like everything just happened all of a sudden, you know. I mean, and I'd been with Mickey a few times, and I mean, you know, hey, we all have a cocktail and everything, but uh, you know, he had he had slowed down, and and you know, he had been uh, sick for a number of years when he did. Uh, overindulge but I mean he was cutting back and but to have him go that fast was just uh, it was a tragedy and what if he did take care of himself Sparky how, how much longer would he have enjoyed setting <laughs> some records in baseball well I, I I think that he was so good that uh, I can't I, it's just hard for me to believe that he could have been that much better I mean he was already uh, you know you just can't imagine how fast he could run and uh, how far he could hit a ball and I mean he just did everything well I, I think the only way that you could actually say he would have been better is maybe the games that he missed uh, because of uh, you know that degenerative bone disease and things like that maybe the games that he missed if he'd had those days back you know maybe to hit two more home runs or or stole another base or, or whatever but uh, I miss his smile and face and his uh, you know jovial attitude and uh, you know, when you were with Mickey on a one-on-one -on -one basis, he, he just wasn't Mickey Mantle. You know, he was just a, another guy out having fun, and that was the beauty of him. Well, Spark, you talk about Ted Williams and the slider coming into your life. What pitching coach made the biggest impact on you? And do you have any thoughts about coaching or p being a pitching coach in the major leagues or professional baseball? I, you know, I had a number of pitching coaches. Uh, Sal Magley was my first pitching coach, and and uh, <laughs> he got me fined. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I had struck Norm Cash out the first five times I ever faced a guy on, at the most, four pitches. And so they're coming back in uh, at the end, towards the end of the year there, and Sal Magley tells me, you know, he says, you can't throw that slider that Norm Cash all the time. He's going to hit that. He says, you've got to come up and in with the fastball every now and get him back off that plate. So, I mean, uh, you know, I, I end up facing him in that series. And, and, you know, and I was 21 years old, and I, I listened to everything that my coaches told me. And, you know, I was in a learning process, and uh, this was a lesson well learned that Sal Magley didn't know what the hell he was talking about because, <laughs> because I did – 
try and come in with a fastball, well, that baby's still going. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then Dick Williams wanted to know what, what I'm doing throwing him a fastball. <laughs> so, and I didn't tell. I never told on Sal. I never told, said that he told me to do that, but Dick fined me another 100 bucks for throwing a fastball. He said, you've been getting this guy out with sliders. Why would you ever do something like that? So, <laughs> Sparky <laughs> Lyle, we would love another hour or two with you, but uh, just looking at today's baseball talent out there on the field, is, is there a player we should look at through your eyes do you think right now is going to be, without question, a, a Hall of Famer some year? Well, there's no question in my mind. I mean, you got Barry Bonds, you got uh, King Griffey Jr., Frank Thomas, uh, you got... Uh, How about uh, relief pitchers? Well, uh, you know, the relief pitchers now, I mean, you get those fireballers out there, and like I say, they haven't really put any pressure on those guys, and, I, and I'm not taking anything away from it. Please don't think I'm talking about sour grapes here, but but I think you really want to want to test them out. I mean, you you start bringing those guys in with with people on second and third with one out, or the bases loaded, or or a guy on first with nobody out that can steal second and third, and let's see how they do there. You know, it, it's it's pretty easy to uh, come in there and and start the ninth inning with nobody on, and uh, you know you walk out a hero. I said, you know, hey, you know, put them in with some guys on. Well, Check. let's find out what, in the last moment we have here, and I know Russ wants the same uh, question. What is Sparky Lyle doing today? Well, I do a lot of things for the Major League alumni. Uh, we do a lot of incentive programs. Uh, this year we're working with Campbell Soups, Nabisco, uh, MCI. Uh, we do a, a tours of a lot of military bases uh, for MCI. and uh, So I, I pretty much travel around. I mean, I do a lot of personal appearances, but it's through the Major League alumni. and. And I enjoy meeting new people and going to different places, and I have fun everywhere I go, so I'm going to do this as long as I can. What's your family like today, Glenn Sparky? Uh, my family, i got three boys. Uh, my oldest son just got married. Uh, i got a 22-year-old at Pitt, and i uh, got a 15-year-old at home, and they're all driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Sparky? I'm going to end it on that note, because that's what your personality is all about. And on behalf of Russ Dietrich and myself, we thank you for this very special moment. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. It was very nice. Thank you. The postscript, Sparky Lyle, in 1977, was the Cy Young Award winner. In 1976, the Yankees won their first pennant in a dozen years, and Sparky Lyle had a 2.25 ERA, 23 saves, and 104 innings pitched. He was the man manager Billy Martin always turned to when the game was on the line. He won the Cy Young in 1977, and after a contract dispute in 1978, Sparky Lyle was sent packing to Texas. After he was sent packing to Texas, he wrote a book called The Bronx Zoo, which was extremely controversial and was the inside look at the world champion New York Yankees during the year 1977. Here are some highlights of that particular year. Uh, togetherness to me is so important on a team. Uh, I try to teach it uh, when I talk to him. It's the ninth, down by two, and it's all up to Roy White. Randolph on base. Bill Campbell, the windup, the pitch, and the fastball is hit. It's gone. Roy White ties it in the ninth. Oh, White comes through, and this crowd is delirious as the Yankees tie it. Jackson, a drive to right, and it's off the wall. Five to three, New York leading bottom of the ninth. Bouncing ball, Nettles goes to Randolph, one over to first. In time, double play, the ball game is over, the Yankees win the American League. As Sparky Lyle closed out the 1977 American League pennant, we also close out our interview with Sparky Lyle. Next week, Jim Roselli will be interviewing the man on Jim's left, welderweight and middleweight former champion, Carmen Basilio.